Follow us to stay updated on debates, discussions, facts and tips about health. Click on the subscribe button and the bell icon for latest updates. Hello and welcome to Health Files. I'm Neelam Singh. India carries an enormous burden of epilepsy. It is estimated that there are around 50 million people living with epilepsy globally, making it one of the most common neurological diseases. Around one-sixth of this population resides in India. By conservative estimates, there are over 8 million people with epilepsy in India. Despite the fact that an estimated 70% of people living with epilepsy could live normally if properly diagnosed and treated, the stigma and discrimination that surround epilepsy worldwide are often more difficult to overcome than the disease itself. People living with epilepsy can be targets of prejudice in society, but there are several people who rise above the stigma and create an example for one and all. These are people who show you that a mere disease is not a reason to stop pursuing your dreams. Today, we talk to one such person who is a living example of not just conquering the disease, but an example of making it big in life. Our special guest today is the legendary calligraphy master, Professor Casey Janardhan. Welcome to Janardhan. Thank you. So my first question to you is, please tell us how and when your first diagnosis happened. Well, you see, as a young boy, I had a lot of uncomfortable feelings when I was given a head bath. And uh, when I was very young, I was not able to express or explain what I'm going through. But then uh, since it was so uncomfortable and when given a head bath, I used to clench my teeth. I used to become stiff. And then, you know, after a few seconds or so, I would lose my consciousness. Then after I am allowed to sleep for an hour or two, I would get up and behave normally and be normal, run around and do things. But this uncomfortable experiences, which I could not express, were something which was uh, a kind of, uh, you know, difficult to get along with. So what I did was when I was given a head bath or when somebody said have a hacker, I would run away from the sea. Literally, I would be chased and captured and then given a hacker and given a head bath. But again, uh, my mother and then uh, the other relatives around thought I was putting up some kind of child tantrums. But then in 67, 68, when I was staying in Bangalore in my maternal grandfather's house, uh, my maternal grandfather was mentioning this to his doctor. There was one doctor called Dr. Nayak who used to come from Nimhans and it was known as mental hospital those days. And when he was trying to tell him, he said, well, there could be some kind of an issue or a condition. Why not you take him across to Nimhans and then check it out? And that's when in 67, 68, when I went to Nimhans, Dr. K.S. Mani, who, was, who later was known as the father of epilepsy, diagnosed my condition as hot water epilepsy and started the treatment. So how did it impact your growing up years? rather than the condition of epilepsy, the medical condition was easy to handle, except that I didn't want to have a head bath indoors and I tried to move outdoors to have a head bath. But then the social stigma was the most challenging and the strongest. You can imagine in the late 60s and early 70s, people were not so well informed and the awareness was very little. So, and nobody knew the expansion of Nimhans. They only called it a mental hospital. So a person visiting a mental hospital is called as a mad person. And uh, people thought that it was some kind of a disease. And so my aunts, uncles, my friends, and some relatives, they wouldn't allow children of my age to play with me. And when they were going away for some picnic or some kind of a fun outing, they would always leave me alone. So what happens to people who face this kind of challenges is that, you know, you are getting uh, ostracized, you're rejected, and then you are maligned because you have uh, some kind of a condition which they think is contagious because they're not aware. And it also sets in some kind of a depression because everybody likes to be included and everybody likes to be given an attention when you're a child. So that is how I faced some kind of a depression and uh, a lot of rejection, maligning, and then ostracization. So I sat down to think, what is happening? 
Then I realized at the age of seven to eight that, you know, the world likes beautiful people, world likes performers, talents, and achievers. So then I found that I have a lot of innate abilities, like, you know, in mimicry, mono acting, painting, sculpting, uh, miniature model making, a lot of them. So I tried to bring out each one of them and started showcasing them. Then what happened is the people around me started getting diverted to looking at these kind of talents. And they started forgetting about the condition called epilepsy. So that made me realize very early in life that there is no business like show business and get ready to get noticed. What was the reaction of your family members? See, I come from a family where my father is a doctor. And so he was telling my mother, this is like passing clouds. It will pass away. It will go away. Don't worry. But my mother was always worried. And even today, she is 83 plus, And she always is worried, even though I am completely cured after 20 years of treatment. She still, you know, is uh, like a helicopter mom who is trying to keep check of where I am, what I am doing. Because she says... Uh, people don't understand the trauma that a parent goes through in those times. And then always they're worried about what may happen. You see, so my mother is still continuing with it. But my father being a doctor, he was very cool about it. And then uh, he didn't uh, really get perturbed by it. But my aunts and uncles, you know, normally what happens is when somebody has a condition like this, there's more of sympathy coming. I would... Uh, feel that, you know, I feel that rather than sympathy, if people could understand what is empathy, it would be better for them to understand rather than just sympathizing. As an adult, what were the challenges that you faced while dealing with a largely misunderstood neurological disorder? See, the problem today also is that we have an educated society, but unfortunately, I would like to say that we have a lot of educated people who are actually suffering from you know, uh, intellectual poverty. I'm sorry to use this word, but then the right word I feel is intellectual poverty because they, they fail to understand these conditions. So when you try to educate them and tell one section of the society that it is not evil that is possessing a person, we are trying to tell people that, look, it's not somebody's sin of the Esther uh, uh, years or the Esther birth or whatever it is, the last birth and things like that as myths go on. And then we are also trying to tell people that, you know, it is a medical condition. It is not a mental disease. It is not a disability. It is just for a few seconds that somebody goes through a condition and it is eminently treatable. The mindsets of people are so that, you know, they have a blocked mindset, not willing to understand and accept what it is. That is where more misconceptions and myths are being spread. And still people are not trying to understand. We are trying to do this. That's a challenge to get them to understand because they suffer from intellectual poverty. How did you go on to script your success story and how did it all happen? Success story was... It all began when I was seven to eight, when I realized that you need to showcase your abilities and talents. And as I said, like the Titan watch company had a slogan, get ready to get noticed. I brought out my talents in speaking, public speaking, which was natural to me. And in the art forms like painting, sculpting, etc. Then I decided to do something in the field of handwriting where people were suffering with bad handwriting and millions of people even today are suffering with bad writing with no proper instructions and remedies for them. So that made me go into it and one led to the other and I discovered seven areas in handwriting and I went on to train people in handwriting. I went on to become a professional calligrapher in this uncharted field and get a lot of clients. Of course, it was a very a difficult task. It was Herculean to break through the formal cordons with something informal and then uh, make my mark. And uh, well, success has come in in large measures. It's been a roller coaster ride as far as uh, socioeconomic conditions are there, medical socioeconomic conditions. But then success has come in large numbers. Like, you know, I ended up teaching the British what is right and wrong in handwriting in various universities and county schools in Britain. And my research work 
on my own led me to explore the alphabet A to Z. And literally from America to New Zealand, it allowed me to travel. And uh, it got me a lot of attention, a lot of uh, awards and rewards. And uh, it made me the first in many things, like you know, the only Indian to be allowed to write my own passport. I also became the only Indian to teach the British power handwriting. And the, uh, you know, only Indian to start a company, I registered a company, didn't really do business in England, but registered a limited company for this particular purpose of handwriting and calligraphy. And then uh, there were uh, so many other things. Uh, the newspapers and magazines started writing the stories. A lot of popularity came in and then the acceptance. So once you succeed, once you perform, people started accepting it. And recent times, the Lifetime Achievement Award from a blog called Inked Happiness. And then the greatest was, you know, becoming the masterclass trainer for handwriting with a famous, uh, world famous pen manufacturing company called the Mont Blanc. A lot of things have happened. Many, many wonderful things have happened. And even a few countries offering me extraordinary permanent visa under exceptional skills. I'm glad to share all this with you because even normal people, as well as people who are born with challenges, if they can find out what their innate abilities are, which are born with them and polish them and use it to the maximum, they can do wonders in this world. What I've achieved is a small speck, but people can do much better than what I have done. What are the different problems that an epileptic person face? Generally, you know, if you see an epileptic person, first thing is uh, not being accepted as a normal person. The family to the friend circle in the society can be rejecting them or ostracizing them, labeling them with different kinds of things. This can be very depressing. And the medication is long term. Now it's about three to five years. And if you have an attack, again, you need to continue for another three to five years. So that is one strict regimen somebody has to follow. If you miss it, again, you've got to repeat it. Then comes, you know, schooling. Some of them who have got some stronger uh, or different uh, kinds of epilepsy have problems with memory. So, you know, schooling is a problem because you can't get the right kind of grades. You could be sent out of school. And then comes employment. Now, many employers don't understand this condition. And on some other pretext, they'd like to send them out of their jobs. And then even if you were applying for a job and you didn't have this condition and it later developed, again, you're being discriminated in jobs. And when it comes to marriage, whether to disclose or not to disclose, if you disclose, people would not want to, would want to marry you. And then, you know, uh, people would not uh, want to go ahead with this marriage. And if you don't disclose, and especially women, once they get married and then later they come to know they're getting divorced. So, and then driving your mobility is affected because in India, the rule says, if you say that you have had epilepsy at some point of time or the other, you're not given a license to drive. But there are a lot of people who have got licenses and they're driving. And all over the developed countries like UK, Europe, US, and uh, various other countries, they allow people to drive their own private vehicle. If you are free from seizures for about a year, each country has a different uh, condition, like you know, one year of seizure free, or if you're not taking medication for one year. But then it's like that one year is a kind of a period that they want to check out and a certificate from your neurologist. And then you're allowed to drive your own vehicle. It's also like, you know, people who have uh, issues with, uh, you know, physical disability or so, they're also given special cars with special kind of, uh, you know, setup where they can drive. So these are the issues that uh, epileptic faces as a challenge. Secondly, I would appeal that not to get depressed when you are always being uh, put down, ridiculed or rejected. You'll have to gather yourself up and then perform. Once you perform, people will forget about your condition. How does an epileptic person spend his life? What are the limitations and challenges? I could say that if a person has epilepsy, it depends upon which strata of society they belong to their uh, awareness and their education levels and maturity levels to understand themselves. Uh, many people who don't understand it are uh, in a state of shock and they're depressed. And those who understand it also, some people seek a lot of sympathy 
and uh, they like to be you know taken care of or they would always like to seek some kind of help some of them misuse this condition also to seek a lot of help and uh, they don't want to work they want to be taken care of by people around them and always finding an excuse not to do something because of this condition the third type is they understand themselves they are self assured with their self confidence and they want to work they want to do something those are the ones who also face challenges as i said about mobility or employment but then it's each one who has to find their way out and uh, deal with it you got to help yourself so that you can really come out of it and there are uh, counselors who also help them now there are a lot of counseling that is being done where you can help people to come out of their condition and accept it as well as lead a normal life you can lead a normal life i have been leading a normal life for the last uh, 40 years i have been completely cured and uh, absolutely no problem you can be normal as any human being and i have not had uh, any symptoms or a seizure after the uh, mid 80s absolutely nil the quality of life needs to be improved and it's all in your own hands and your mindset how to improve your own quality of life and if you have people around you who can understand you it is better or you'll have to try and make them understand if they don't leave them alone because you'll have you only have to say that okay they are not mature enough to understand this condition what is the current situation of law as related to epileptic people uh as far as marriage is concerned thanks to dr ks money he fought for that law to be changed from a mental disease to a mental condition and a person with epilepsy cannot be divorced on grounds of epilepsy that was the greatest thing that he did and he brought the change now the law has to change as far as uh, driving and epilepsy is concerned to see that people with epilepsy should be allowed to drive their own personal vehicles once the clearance is given from the neurologist it may be a 6 months or a 1 year or a 1 and a half year or 2 year period that they uh, try to decide upon that's the most important thing that needs to be done in this modern developed world we are still you know grappling with all those uh, uh, archaic laws that are there and the people in transport department they are also not aware of this they are still you know trying to go ahead with the old thinking and old thoughts i wish this proper information dawns in their minds and they bring about the much required change to allow people with epilepsy who are cured and uh, who are fit to drive to be allowed to drive their own personal vehicles but then you know driving a public vehicle is always dangerous because you're putting other people's lives in danger as you mentioned uh, you are the only person in india who has written his own passport so how did it happen well i applied for a passport and then uh, just before uh, i went across to the interview i had a few friends who narrated some stories about their passports which are not written properly and they had problems in other countries so i requested the passport authority that uh, i am representing the country in a kind of a, a seminar and a symposium as a handwriting expert so please allow me to write my own passport so that i could project the decorum of this country at the highest level and uh, the person at the counter was really surprised and uh, he said come in let me talk to you i wrote his name then he was you know like somebody says a thing of beauty is joy forever and the first impression makes the best impression and it leaves a lasting impression as a last impression so he said all right i will speak to the passport officer then everything was formalized and they allowed me to write the passport and today it becomes the only passport written by the owner i can't write another passport now because they've all become digitized that's how it happened and also it led me to write my daughter's birth certificate and my father's death certificate three different emotions captured in writing i always wanted to do something different and not be the run on the mill types always try to do something different showcase it so that the world looks at it and then they say all right and i like one of those uh, statements made by the media which is you know an epileptic also can work with precision and uh, two other write ups from the media which said this english this indian taught the english how to write and desi ustad teaches english dons now i mean these things i thought uh, more than uh, you know trying to satisfy me 
it would be a lot of uh, motivation for a lot of other people to do something different and showcase whatever talents they have within themselves, either epileptic or non-epileptic or challenged or non-challenged. Everybody has the right in this world to express themselves and to showcase their abilities and talents. So what, what next? Where from here on? Well, what next in my profession, I am looking at uh, expanding. Okay, I forgot to tell you that I created the first ever museum of handwriting, lettering, calligraphy, fountain pens and writing instruments combination in the world. It's the, one of its kind. Expansion of this museum into a larger space, which will showcase everything from across the world. Educate more people, the students, teachers and parents. And I've also formulated, you know, three-year master trainer programs for teachers to understand what is handwriting and then carry forward. It could lead to 30 lakhs to one crore job creation in this country. And later, the final thing is something like a world alphabet university. This is what I want to create in my profession. Regarding epilepsy, there are many areas which are still yet to be addressed. Okay, the Indian Epilepsy Association and various other groups are trying to bring in more awareness through street plays and various awareness programs in schools. But then what needs to be looked at is from the questions that I was asked in the uh, past few years by people affected with epilepsy or the parents is, I have a child who is 30 years old now, unmarried. Now who's going to take care of them once we the parents are gone from this world? So that uh, says that you need to have an old age home to take care of people with epilepsy because they will all be single and not married, or even if they're married, they're divorced. Then comes next question is, I am born with epilepsy or I'm suffering with epilepsy or I'm cured. And then, but then I have problems in mobility. So who's going to take me across to my place of work and drop me back? Now parents are doing that as they get older, they say, we can't be accompanying them on every trip. Some people may even get an attack once in a week or once a day. So for such kind of people, is there a pickup and drop that you can organize who are genuinely suffering from epilepsy. And the third thing is employment. Do you have some kind of an employment bureau where you can try and see that they're placed in different corporates according to their abilities and their uh, natural abilities or qualifications or their skill sets? Can you get them jobs? Because they also need to make a living. They can't become parasites or they can't become dependent people. They also would like to be not totally independent, but then interdependent people so get them jobs and uh, one of the groups in mumbai is also into marriage bureau trying to uh, get people married who are with epilepsy and with the understanding now these are all the issues that we need to take up in bangalore my dream would be to first you know get some vehicles through rotary or other organizations to pick up and drop the genuine ones who are suffering with epilepsy to go to work and come back and then to create an old age home and also to create uh, employment bureau for them and improve the quality of life and make them feel much better, not rejected, don't feel dejected, you're not maligned, you're not ostracized, but you are wanted because you have special abilities. And one thing that I would like to mention to all people with epilepsy is that there's a big list I can read out of people. We are in very good company, great company. You must have heard about Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Napoleon Bonaparte, painter Van Gogh, Socrates, and then Leonardo da Vinci, the list goes on. There are so many eminent people who have been remembered centuries after they're gone. And we are in good company of them. Who knows? You could be one of them. You could be one of them in the making. Who knows? Just explore yourself. And you could be the next Julius Caesar or next uh, Alexander the Great in your own way. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your story, thoughts, and future plans with us. It was really great having you and learning so many things. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.